Welcome to the Crystal Lake Historical Society presentation featuring the Sears Kit Homes of Crystal Lake. My name is Ann Viger, Vice President of the Crystal Lake Historical Society Board. This program was first presented live at the Society's 2023 annual meeting. The subject of Sears Kit Homes is vast with far too much material to pack into one presentation. Therefore, we're, we are keeping the majority of our focus local the Sears Kit Homes of Crystal Lake. First, a little background. Around the turn of the 20th century, Sears entered the Catalan home selling business. Sears was already a powerhouse retailer, thanks to the distribution of their general merchandise catalog, which contained every necessary item for the household and farm. Sears was known for their reliability, convenience, and quality. This 1928 home catalog cover refers to the homes as honor built modern homes, a term used to market the pre cut version of the homes. Not all kits were honor built. However, for the purposes of this presentation, we will simplify the terminology and refer to them all as Sears kit homes. Kit homes were popular for their simplicity and innovative building techniques. The homes could be constructed by largely untrained labor in 90 days and could be shipped almost anywhere in the U.S. Sears designed, cut, manufactured, packaged, and shipped more than 70,000 homes between 1908 and 1942. They created hundreds of different floor plans and exteriors and were able to customize the designs to fit the customer's preferences. The methods of construction were extremely efficient and, and affordable. In fact, some modern carpentry techniques were invented by Sears in order to facilitate the homes being built by unskilled labor. While there is no known list of all Sears homes in existence, many fascinated researchers have compiled extensive information on the homes and their locations. More details can easily be found online and several books have been published. In 1911, you could purchase either of these two quaint homes for several hundred dollars. Still using numbers to identify the models at this point, the Sears Modern Homes catalog contained 98 unique house plans, including several multi-unit apartment buildings and garage structures. As time went on, the architectural design of the homes became more sophisticated. The models were named instead of numbered to appeal to buyers, and many options were provided as shown in pages from this 1934 catalog. Home kits included everything you needed to build your home. Lumber, hardware, fixtures, windows, doors, and siding. Also included were plumbing fixtures, appliances, custom millwork, and even air conditioning in some cases. The simplified methods of construction, including a framing technique to eliminate the need for heavy timbers, made it possible for someone with modest carpentry skills to build their own home. Sometimes that's exactly what happened. The owner built his own home with the help of friends and neighbors. Often carpenters were hired to construct the homes. Because of their straightforward design and immense popularity, a variety of other kit home companies were very active during the early part of the 1900s. Many of them copied each other's plans and building elements. Sears had a major advantage, name recognition and a reliable reputation thanks to a little thing called the Sears catalog. It was easy. There were approximately 360 design styles over the years, and many builders offered customization. As many of these homes approach being 100 years old, most have been modified, sometimes making them appear quite different from the original plans. This is a good point in the presentation to say that the Crystal Lake Historical Society continues to research the homes that are suspected to be Sears kit homes. And as you will see later in the presentation, new information has been discovered as recently as last week. It is suggested that at least two pieces of authentic information are on record before verifying that a home was a Sears kit home. For example, a home here in Crystal Lake on Golf Road was once widely believed to be a Sears home. It has now been positively identified as a Wardway home. The kit home sold by Montgomery Wards because of labels found stamped on boards during a remodeling project. 
some methods of identification are numbered building components, which correspond to the instruction manual, although other kit homes also had numbered components, sales contracts, loan agreements, and shipping labels. Goodwall sheet plaster, what we call drywall today, was manufactured by Sears and is unique to a Sears home. Plumbing fixtures were stamped with an SR. Of course, with the age of these homes, it's doubtful that many of the original fixtures are still in place. Another commonly seen detail, although not exclusive to Sears homes, is a square block where moldings meet at angles. It wasn't necessary for an unskilled carpenter to match odd angles, making construction easier. Another common detail is shown here on the column of the Valonia model. Again, I'll emphasize that appearance alone is not enough to positively identify a Sears kit home. There are homes in Crystal Lake that are not included in this program, but are considered to be probable Sears homes, and others that are kit homes, but not from Sears. Now let's turn to Crystal Lake to learn about some of the Sears kit homes that were constructed and are still standing today. In the early 1900s, Crystal Lake was like many American suburbs, growing quickly and eager to accommodate new families with good jobs and steady incomes. Thanks to bustling local businesses, many of which were served by the railroad, Crystal Lake was vibrant and growing and earning our slogan, a good place to live. As we will learn, Sears houses were homes for families of all sizes and generations, sometimes multiple generations, some were occupied by the original owner for only a short time, and some for an entire lifetime. Sears kit homes are often found in clusters. That is, several are located on a street or nearby each other in a neighborhood. If you're wondering why that is, well, there is something to that old saying about keeping up with the Joneses. The kits were affordable and appealed to owners settling in new neighborhoods throughout the city. Sometimes a carpenter would buy two lots, build two homes, then sell them both for profit. Sometimes several members of the same family would purchase lots and build near each other. Sometimes an individual would build two at a time, one for himself and one to sell. The inner circle depicts one third of a mile from the train station and the outer circle depicts three quarters of a mile. Almost all of the authenticated homes in Crystal Lake were built within this circle due to the proximity of the train station, which not only facilitated the population growth in Crystal Lake, but also made shipping easier and more effective for kit homes. One was built more than three quarters of a mile from the train depot, and one was moved farther away in the 1970s. Next, we'll talk a little more about the details of some of the homes and their histories first focusing on the neighborhoods near the intersection of Terracotta Avenue, Route 176 and Main Street, north of the train tracks. 160 Glen Avenue, the Adara, built in 1926, original owners Frederick and Mabel Bristol. The Adara model was first available in 1919 and is unusual for its attached garage. Fred Bristol was a signalman for the Chicago and Northwestern Railroad for 36 years. The couple built this home in 1926 and celebrated their 30th anniversary here on May 16, 1929. Shown here is what appears to be a testimonial written by Fred and used in a Sears marketing piece. Interestingly, Fred went on to build another very unique house nearby. After retiring from the railroad and wanting to downsize, Fred used his connections and obtained an old railroad car, bought a lot on John Street, and turned the old wooden coach car into a house. 170 Glen Avenue, The Crescent, built in 1927. Original owners, Henry and Eliza Hansen. The Hansons purchased the land in 1925 for $313.50 and lived here from 1927 to 1934. Shown here is the shipping receipt, which helps authenticate the home. Henry was a farmer and a carpenter. 
he built the house while still farming in Barrowville and rented it out until he retired to Crystal Lake. Also a Crescent model, this home is nearby at 232 Glen Avenue. Built in 1927, original owners, Hungarian immigrants, Gabriel and Mary Che. The Crescent was one of Sears' most popular models. As evidence, there are three of them here in Crystal Lake. The plan was copied by a kit home competitor and a second floor was added to some models. Gabriel, a cabinet maker, lived to be 97 years old, living the last 50 years of his life in this house. Gabriel and Mary celebrated their 60th wedding anniversary here in 1969. As you can see in the photo at right, the front porch has been enclosed, covering the columns in beautiful arched canopy. 180 Glen Avenue, The Bedford, built in 1927, original owners, Fred and Mary Schroeder. The, the Schroeders purchased this lot on March 18, 1927 for $198. The home was built as their retirement home. Fred had worked at American Terracotta and Ceramic. Their eldest son, Frank, lived nearby on Ellsworth Avenue. The second floor was rented to Frank and Idella Swenson, a young mechanic and his wife. Later, Mr. Curtis, the community high school chemistry teacher, was a renter. The Schroeders had moved to Carpentersville by 1936. Again, we see some modifications in the current day photo. The dormer appears to have been rebuilt and the front steps have been centered. It appears there was no fireplace built as shown in the advertising photo. One eighty five Glen Avenue, the Sunlight, built in nineteen twenty seven. Original owners Lester and Alma Happner. The Happners lived here for only two years, then moved to Elburn in nineteen twenty nine. In nineteen thirty, the house was then rented by Carl and Clara Orwall. The home was modest with two bedrooms and one bathroom. Carl, shown here, his wife Alma, two daughters, Carl's sister in law, and two Swedish boarders shared this small space. Carl's mother and stepfather, Frank Anderson, lived kitty corner in the next Sears home we will, we will visit at 202 Glen Avenue. Carl and Alma met while working at the Elgin Watch Factory and were secretly married in 1922. After Carl left the factory, he became a building painter and a decorator. He was also an accomplished speed skater, winning the McHenry County Championship several times in the 1920s. Carl later became known as the local Santa Claus in the 1950s. 202 Glen Avenue, the Manchester, built in 1927. Original owners, Frank and Francis Anderson. The Andersons purchased the land and built this home in 1927. They lived here until 1952. The Manchester was a duplex with one bedroom on the second floor and two on the first. The Andersons rented the second floor of their home and also shared their first floor space with a boarder. Frank Anderson was a mechanic who did some of his work in the garage, which had a workman's pit in the floor. We met one of the Andersons' children, Carl Orwall, in the previous home. The Barrington, 215 Illinois Street, built between 1926 and 1929. Original owner, Christina Grantham. The first owner of 215 Illinois Street was Christina Grantham, widow of Arthur W. Grantham, who died in 1917 and is buried in Union Cemetery. Christina was a telephone operator for Illinois Bell and lived here until her death in 1965. Christina's sister, Eliza Baer, lived in a Sears home at 170 Glen Avenue, one of the Crescent models we saw earlier in the presentation. The lot was purchased on October 14, 1925, for $346.50. It should be noted that there are two other suspected Sears homes on Illinois Street, but positive identification has not been made. The City of Crystal Lake Historic Preservation Commission recently approved landmark status for 215 Illinois Street. The city's landmark program bestows legal protection to a property for the purpose of preserving its public character and history. 
a landmarked property is recognized as a public asset that enriches the community of crystal lake by virtue of its architecture and or the people and events associated with it this home has been slightly modified over the years but the exterior shake siding is original 228 3rd Street, The Mayfield, built in 1940. Original owners, Robert and Blanche Kerwin. Just west of Main Street, we find two more Sears kit homes. Well, maybe we do. This home at 228 3rd Street is the first of two homes in this presentation that have recently come into question. It is believed to be the Mayfield model, but has not been positively identified. Montgomery Ward offered a similar kit home with a similar floor plan. An interior inspection would help with verification. This home cost $3,000 to purchase and was built by the owner, Robert Kerwin. Robert was the youngest son of Charles and Selena Kerwin. He was a skilled machinist working in his father's machine shop. He was also a talented saxophonist working in the machine shop by day and performing with Leonard's Blue Rhythm Band of Elgin at night. Charles and Selena's son John owned Kerwin's slide film factory on Railroad Street for 37 years. The land for this home was given to Robert and Blanche, shown here, by his father and was nearby the machine shop. The Mayfield model was basically the old Berwyn model that was marketed with a new name beginning in 1938. 233 3rd Street, The Maplewood, built in 1930 original owners, Herman and Marie Berkeley. The builder of this and several other Sears kit homes was Fred J. Glau. The Maplewood features a prominent front gable projection with arched doorway and a distinctive fireplace. It has three bedrooms, one bathroom, a living room, dining room, and kitchen. Built in 1930, the price of this home was $4,000 and it was built on a lot owned by Marie's father, William H. Orkvitz, next door to the house where she grew up. Marie was employed by Home State Bank when she became engaged to Herman Berkeley. Marie applied for the building permit during the period of their engagement, and the newlyweds moved into this home in 1930. They lived here until 1955. Moving farther south, we will now spotlight some homes located between Crystal Lake Avenue and Virginia Street, or Route 14, south of the train tracks. 174 Eastview, the Valonia, built in 1927, original owners Nels and Anna Pearson. On the first floor, the floor plan was altered from this drawing. The bedroom closest to the porch was open to the living room with a large archway between and used as a parlor. The archway shown here is at the bottom of the stairs. The remaining bedroom was down the hall and used as a master bedroom. Also, the front porch steps, which were to be wood, were omitted from the original order because Nels planned to construct those himself in concrete. This was something he learned working for his cousin in Chicago when he first emigrated. The roof was originally done in green asphalt shingles. The Valonia was one of the most enduring designs that Sears offered, appearing in the catalog for 25 years. It's a craftsman style bungalow with a single dormer on the front and side gabled. The first floor plan changed slightly over the years, as did the number and arrangement of windows in the dormer and on the side of the house. The first floor had two bedrooms, a dining room, a living room, and a kitchen. As an option, the second floor could also be finished with up to three bedrooms. The house was built by Nels Pearson and his Swedish friends on four lots. Nels ordered three sets of paper plans for the house, as well as one plan for the heating system, one for the lighting, and one for the plumbing. According to the contract of the loan Nels and Anna took out, they had four months to build the home. Nels worked at Oak Manufacturing and Anna worked at the Crystal Lake Country Club. Shipments came from six destinations throughout the Midwest. It included between 10 and 30,000 individual pieces and a 75-page instruction book.
The ready cut garage, also a kit from Sears, was built behind the house with a double door facing west. The driveway ran along the west side of the house and continued straight through from Eastview to Lille Avenue. In June of 1957, when Nels was almost 72 years old and still working at Oak Manufacturing, he single-handedly turned his garage to face Eastview Avenue using a combination of jacks and roller skates. Two weddings took place in the home. The first one between Nels and Anna's daughter, Agnes Cecilia Pearson and Malcolm Tips took place on June 27, 1936 with Reverend Chilblum from, the, from Bethany Lutheran Church presiding and 40 guests present. The second wedding also involved Agnes, now widowed. She and Leslie Heaton Burbank were married on December 11, 1948 with Reverend Nelson, pastor of Bethany Lutheran Church presiding. The ceremony was conducted under the archway between the living room and parlor. 51 Maple Street, the Valonia, built in 1929, original owners Charles and Mary Wagner. The second authenticated Valonia model in Crystal Lake was built two years after the Valonia on Eastview and was built by Fr carpenter Fred Glau. Charles Wagner, the original owner, worked for the Bowman Dairy in Crystal Lake. The Wagners lived here from 1929 to 1962. One of the most stunning features of the Valonia is the expansive front porch framed by craftsman style columns. Shown here are Charles and Mary Wagner and their daughter Esther. Even though they're not smiling, I've got to think they are enjoying that beautiful porch. Here is the porch today. We can see the distinctive craftsman style columns sitting on green brick pillars and the original eaves overhang the entire width of the porch. In these recent photos of the interior of the home, we can see the interesting peaked arches over the doorway openings and original wood, baseboards, and flooring throughout the first floor of the home. The home was authenticated by the shipping label and stamped wood trim and floor pieces. At the top of the landing, we see the unique block at the intersection of two angular baseboard cuts. Although some changes have been made, including a large two-story addition in 2004, this Felonia is still a beauty. The Hamilton 102 Maple, built in 1927. Original owners, James and Jenny Roxborough. James and Jenny Roxborough were Scottish emigrants and lived here the rest of their lives. The following photos were provided by the current owner, depicting some of the interior details of the home. The front door is solid oak. The oak window seat in the dining room was standard to the Hamilton model. The brick fireplace and oak mantle and corbels are original and appear to be standard in the Hamilton. Oak cold register grates were standard. Shown here is a number stamped on the lumber. This one, this one is on a floor joist. And here is the Goodwall sheet plaster sign that, sign that the owner found while doing some remodeling. Still a charmer, this home was plaqued by the McHenry County Historical Society in 2005. Upon approval of an application, the McHenry County Historical Society will plaque an historic site or structure as a means of calling attention to the heritage of McHenry County. It's not a legal proceeding and thus does not interfere with the buying and selling of the property. However, once plaqued, the plaque will remain with and on the structure or site not with the owner of the property at the time of placking. Just across the street at 101 Maple, another Hamilton model was also built in 1927. Original owners, Eugene and Rosa Mae Cox. As shown by this newspaper notice from, 19, uh, from November 18th, 1926, Eugene found a blind mare on his farmland and searched for the rightful owner, who was then asked to pay for the ad. 
Maybe this adventure created their desire to move to the city. They auctioned the farm and moved into their new Sears house in March 1927. They must not have enjoyed city life, though, because in 1933 the Coxes swapped this house with farmers William and August Cron and returned to farming. Two ninety seven McHenry Avenue, the Hamilton, built in nineteen twenty six to twenty seven, original owners Schuyler and Mary Hayes. Another Hamilton bungalow, the home at two ninety seven McHenry Avenue, was bought for three thousand three hundred eleven dollars and seventy five cents by Schuyler Vernon Hayes. To keep the construction costs low, he performed one third of the labor himself while paying a contractor provided by Sears to construct the balance. The Crystal Lake Historical Society is fortunate to have in its archives some paperwork from the purchase and construction of 297 McHenry Avenue. Shown here are the sales contract, construction estimate, construction progress report, and even a letter from Sears regarding delinquent payments on the loan. Schuyler Hayes worked for the Public Service Company, which was located in the Teckler Building in downtown Crystal Lake, the location of today's Heisler's Bootery. To help with fi the family finances, the Hayeses rented out a room over their garage. Despite this extra income, Hayes still struggled to pay the $50 per month mortgage payment to Sears. Eventually, the loan was paid off, but a very young Schuyler died in 1930 at the age of 30 due to chronic health issues from his service during World War I. 162 Rosedale, the Willard, built in 1928, original owners, Francis and Francis Heath. For those of you paying attention, this is the second Francis and Francis couple in our presentation. The Willard model was available for 11 years between 1928 and 1939. This Willard was built as a mere reverse of the catalog drawing. We're fortunate to have several photos of this home during construction. The Heaths purchased two lots in 1925. They had moved from Chicago to Crystal Lake, which was the end of the line of the Chicago and Northwestern Railroad. Frank was a switchman and later a conductor from 1917 to 1957. Francis cleaned the Pullman cars when they were parked in Crystal Lake. The cost of construction was $1,910. Fred J. Glau was the contractor, but most of the home was built by the Heath family themselves over a three-year period. Frank and Frances Heath and their two children, King and Dawn, lived in their garage while the house was being built. When Frances died in 1934, Frank moved to Chicago, but returned to the house in 1942. He remarried in 1948, shown here, and they lived at 162 Rosedale until Frank died. The original Sears plans were found in a basement wall of the home. The house was rented after Frank's death until King sold it in 1974. The house has been plaqued by the McHenry County Historical Society. The Willard was a Tudor Revival house plan, and due to its unique style, it was one of Sears' most popular models. The small home could be built on a narrow lot. The first floor held a kitchen, dining room, and living room with distinctive corner fireplace. Upstairs are two bedrooms and a bath. Not only are we fortunate to have so many photos during the construction of this home, but it is still a beauty today. Earlier, we saw a map showing the close proximity of the Crystal Lake Sears homes to the train tracks and train depot. In addition to the main line running from Chicago, a spur was built along Dole Avenue in the, in the 1870s that carried ice harvested from Crystal Lake to the tracks and even carried wedding guests to the Dole Mansion in 1883. The tracks were removed in the early 1920s, but it's likely that this spur further helped delivery of the kit home pieces to some of the home sites, including the next one we'll visit on West Crystal Lake Avenue. 355 West Crystal Lake Avenue, the Osborne, built in 1916 by Swedish builder Fred Kling. 
original owners, Fred and Anna Kling. Fred Kling was the builder of many homes in Crystal Lake, but this one was special. He built it for himself and his new wife as their honeymoon home. The original floor plan featured a living room, dining room, one bathroom, two bedrooms, and three porches. Fred Kling and Anna Karlstadt were married in the living room of their new home on June 16, 1916, at 8 o'clock in the evening. Reverend Headstrand of the Swedish Mission Church officiated. It was reported that, quote, following the ceremony, an elaborate supper was served to the guests who were privileged to witness the ceremony. The house was prettily decorated with pink and white roses and syringa. Fred was born in Germany in Sweden in 1880 and came to the United States with his family directly to Crystal Lake at the age of 11. For many years, he was a building contractor, known for his skilled work with Fieldstone. After retiring, he worked in real estate. This photo shows Fred and Anna with their son Gordon Kling in 1937. Note the beautiful rock gardens. For many years, Anna was a member of the Rose Chapter of the Crystal Lake Garden Club and won ribbons for flowers, fruits, and vegetables at their annual flower show. Described by their son Gordon, who lived there 1917 to 1938, its exterior walls were stuccoed and to the stucco was added a dash of small pieces of clamshells, byproducts of the shell button industry. This made the walls a gleaming white. On the lot west of the house were planted fruit trees, apple, plum, pear, and cherry. East of the house were two large bur oak trees. Norway maple trees lined the street in front. This house remained in the Kling family until 1971. 220 College Street, the Dover, built in 1929 by Guy Crabtree, original owners Axel and Dagmar Lindmark. Earlier in the presentation, we discussed the difficulty of identifying some Sears kit homes. Well, 220 College Street definitely belongs in the category of don't judge a book by its cover. Long assumed to be the Dover model because of its very distinctive exterior, recent research has brought the home's origin into question. So where do the questions arise? We know that there were other kit home manufacturers active in Crystal Lake during the same period as, of time as Sears. We also know that local lumber yards sold house plans similar to the kit homes. Shown here is a 1928 newspaper ad for Rosenthal Lumber disputing the cost efficiency of Sears homes. The question was asked to local contractors how much cheaper can you build a house by using ready-cut lumber? Featured is a quote from the builder of 220 College, Guy Crabtree. It reads, no cheaper. In fact, I must charge more on account of the extra time required in hunting out the pieces. We know that Guy Crabtree was the builder of, this, of the home for the Lindmarks by these two newspaper clippings from August 1928. Why would Mr. Crabtree so openly criticize a project that he was in the midst of? It's inconsistencies like this that bring this Dover into question. Did Crabtree use Sears's Dover plans? If so, did he use a kit or cut his own lumber? Or did he use a similar house plan available locally? Efforts are now underway to discover more information about the home and settle the question once and for all. As stated before, sometimes the stories of the people who built the houses are as interesting as the homes themselves. Whether it is a Sears kit home or not, we do know that Axel Lindmark was a member of Guy Crabtree's crew, but it's not known if Axel worked on this house. The previous year, Axel was working on the new St. Thomas Catholic School building for which Guy Crabtree was the contractor. And on July 5th, 1927, Axel fell and fractured four ribs, sprained a wrist, and tore ligaments in his back. Axel and Dagmar celebrated their 10th anniversary in 1933 in this house before moving in 1934 to Moline, where Dagmar's parents lived. They had been married in Moline 
in 1923 by A.C. Youngdahl, the father of Reverend E.U. Youngdahl, who was a minister of Bethany Lutheran Church in 1933 and lived in a Sears house that we will visit next. The, the Lindmarks later sold their home to Guy Crabtree. Even if it's not a Sears home, this is a great chance to illustrate the creativity of Sears marketing people. This house is described as an Americanized English type colonial one and a half story cottage. Quite a colorful description. Now we'll take a look at a Sears home that was moved from its original location. The Strathmore model, now located at 467 South McHenry Avenue, was once located on Crystal Lake Avenue next to Bethany Lutheran Church. It was built in 1931 for the church by carpenters who were members. The labor and materials were donated by church members because the Great Depression was affecting the local economy. The house is shown here on a Christmas card signed by the Reverend and Mrs. Youngdahl, where it stood adjacent to the church. The house was moved in 1977 when the church needed space for a parking lot. The Strathmore was an English cottage style design with a prominent chimney, window seat beneath leaded glass, and a gabled entry. Today, today the home shows evidence of some exterior alterations, including a second floor addition creating an overhang and a front porch. Notice the beautiful chimney brick and stone detail. 40 Pomeroy, model 124, built in 1913, making it the oldest house in our presentation. Original owners, Arthur and Augusta Mickelson. Built when the models were numbered, not named, this beauty cost $1,185 to purchase. Arthur Mickelson purchased the land for $700 in May of 1913 from Fred and Emma Peterson, who lived at the time next door at 22 Pomeroy. Like Fred Peterson, Arthur was a foreman at American Terracotta and Ceramic in charge of kilns. Arthur was also president of the Board of Education. The Mickelsons lived here for three years. Of special note, small smooth stones for the fireplace and foundation were brought in from the Fox River. The living, room has a, the living room floor has a patterned combination of maple and oak and the original leaded glass remains. The side gabled one and a half story bungalow with gabled dormer has an unusual design feature. The end chimney juts through the gable overhang, which is unfortunately obscured in this photo by a tree. The chimney itself is fashioned in a highly decorative manner and the clapboard piers on the porch are very rare. This house was plaqued by the McHenry County Historical Society in 1996. 84 South Caroline Street, the Auburn, built in 1925. Original owners, Herman and Josephine Dornbush. This home was also built by Fred Glau. Interestingly, one source says the Auburn was only offered in 1925. The Auburn was designed for narrow city lots and the plans called for it to be only 18 feet wide. However, because there was plenty of space here, the sunroom was built on the side of the house rather than the front as called for in the plans. The price of the house and garage was $4,000. H.J. Dornbush had sold his nearby home in Derry to German and Austrian immigrants, George and Christine, Christiana Wagner in 1925. Cows were never milked at that dairy. The dairy was a distribution center for making deliveries around Crystal Lake. Herman and Josephine then moved into this near Sears home, which was located directly south of the dairy on the corner of Caroline and Paddock. The Dornbush family moved up to Waukegan in 1926, but may have rented this house for several years. In 1930, this Sears house was being rented to Roy and Bessie Rhodes, and in 1940, the Dornbush family was back in residence. Our last home is at 182 Lill Avenue, the Crescent, built in 1929, original owners, Carl and Inga Carlson. 
We saw two other Crescent models on Glen Avenue in the first neighborhood we visited earlier in the presentation. This home and garage were built by A.P. Langren in 1929. The original owner, Carl Alban Carlson, was a mason, so he might have done the masonry work on the foundation, fireplace, and porch. Carl and Inga lived here until they divorced in 1937. Kit homes were an important component of American neighborhoods in the early part of the 20th century. Sears kit homes were an easy way for middle-class families to realize their dream of home ownership. Simplified construction techniques encouraged DIYers to build their own home. The designs were imaginative and creative, and the ability to customize the plans added to their appeal. The manufacture of Sears kit homes ended as America entered World War II in 1941. Non-essential construction came to a halt because lumber and other building material were needed in shipyards, aircraft plants, and other war efforts. Here in Crystal Lake, we can reflect on the dozens of families who built and inhabited Sears kit homes over many generations. Understandably, some owners were anxious to modernize the quaint homes to suit their family's needs and lifestyles. Others were cautious and respectfully maintained unique details that were original to their Sears home. Birthdays, weddings, holidays, and other occasions caused families and friends to gather in these Sears kit homes. Perhaps the memories of their laughter and tears still echo in the kitchens, living rooms, dining rooms, and on the porches. The varied neighborhoods of Crystal Lake are made richer because of these special homes and the stories of those who built them. Thank you to board members of the Society for their research and contributions to this presentation, in particular Kurt Pearson, who conducted much of the research while writing two books, Swedenborg and Coming to America. As previously mentioned, although there is not a comprehensive listing of all Sears kit homes in the U.S., you can find a proliferation of information on Sears kit homes on the internet, and several books have been written on the subject. This bibliography lists the primary sources of information in today's program. In, addi in addition to the individuals throughout the presentation, the Society wishes to thank our sister organization, the Crystal Lake Historic Preservation Commission, for its research on Sears Homes. The Commission will be hosting a trolley tour on Sunday, June 11, 2023, featuring over a dozen different models of Sears kit homes in Crystal Lake. Additionally, an exhibit featuring many of the homes in this presentation will be on display at the Colonel Palmer House in Crystal Lake later this spring. Make sure to check the Society's website for detailed information about upcoming events.